What advice would you give an aspiring investor that's, you know, six to 12 months behind you? Really focusing on one market, uh, you know, one or two markets that you really like, whether it's, you know, personally, you have family there uh, or, you know, somewhere that's within a, you know, whether it's 15 minutes or, or a two hour drive, somewhere that you could be that you could drive around and kind of, you know, start looking at uh, real estate and, and looking at the market, you know, go, uh, you know, secret shop in a sense and, and go just find out kind of what's happening, what's what's going on uh, and really hone in on, on one market because, yeah. you know, having good relationships with one to three brokers is a lot more important than having, you know, very partial relationships with 20. Welcome to the Diary on Apartment Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe with Four Oaks Capital. I'm very excited for today's show. It's one of our first deal series episodes. And we have Dylan Palmer with us, who recently closed on a multi-use commercial property with a 31-unit apartment complex on the, on the property in Lexington, Kentucky. And so that said, Dylan, welcome to the show. Hi, uh, thank you for having me, Brian. Happy to be here. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so very impressive what you've done. Uh, I, you know, we've talked about this before, and I'm super excited to dive right in for today's show. But before we start, I want to ask one question just, just to highlight something that the people usually look at as a liability. How old are you? So I, I'm 22 years old. I graduated uh, this past May. Okay. Graduated from San Diego State University, if I'm not mistaken, which is my wife's alma mater. So nice. And we yes, won't sir. talk about the football game online. Yeah, <laughs> no, we won't. We won't. We've already been back and forth. Yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> had the ball bounced the other direction, so to speak, maybe we would talk about it, but uh, um, there we go. So uh, let's start with this. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so your yeah, name's Dylan Palmer. Uh, just graduated this past May. I grew up in Huntington Beach, California. Uh, my parents, you know, they, they grew up uh, in New England, kind of over here on the East Coast, met down in Florida, and then came out uh, to be a part of, you know, the entertainment industry for my father. And then my mom was a part of Marriott. Uh, so both W-2 incomes. Uh, and, you know, kind of grew up, uh, always loved math, was always into finance, uh, and always being, you know, being good at it. Uh, I had a good friend who introduced me to getting kind of a, a math book outside of class. And I distinctly remember, you know, going to that same store, buying the math book to, to try to beat him at it. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've always had a, had a, uh, you know, a niche or a, a kind of uh, enticed uh, draw towards math. And that kind of led me down the, the avenue really of physics initially. Mm -hmm which kind of was the mix of, of math and science and the, and the physical and, and bringing science into the real world. Uh, that's where I you know, first found interest. And I ended up mm -hmm. you know, deciding to, to initially major uh, in physics when I went to San Diego. Yep. At, at the same time, my first semester, the, the group of people that I was kind of surrounded with and then also the material just kind of fell interest uh, and fell mm -hmm. out of interest for me. So I transferred over to the finance department in business and that's where I, you know, really found my skills, you know, coming into play. And mm -hmm. you know, I fell in love with finance and it was with the, with the right people. And I think my you know, personal skill set has really shined uh, with finance. And then that's kind of, you know, brought me to, to my point in real estate. Uh, and that's kind of the, all the background. Yeah, I mean, being good at numbers is important. And, and incidentally, um, I have a bachelor's in math with a minor in physics, you know, so uh, at one point, I, I would say for me, it was the opposite. I was good at math growing up, but I didn't like it. Didn't really start liking it until my senior year in high school. And that's, that's when I decided to, to major in math, but, you know, almost opposite direction. You know, you, you liked math up front and, you know, switch gears and I want to do something besides math and decide, decided to do that. But yeah, knowing, knowing numbers and being able to, to being able to take advantage of that, that knowledge in, in real estate and underwriting is, is extremely helpful. So um, so you graduated in, in May. Let's let's talk about how you got into multifamily. And to your previous point, uh, you know, one thing about you know being uh, well equipped with you know knowing how to how to perform math and in numbers. One of my favorite parts 
uh, you know, really about finance mm -hmm. is that you're taking, you know, these numbers that are on a sheet of paper, uh, you know, you're taking these numbers that are kind of abstract in a sense, and then being able to translate those numbers and to paint a picture for someone, uh, just the average person who doesn't really understand, you know, those whatever yeah. uh, kind of level of math it is for them to be able to understand and paint a picture for them to, to be able to digest and feel confident uh, in, in making a, a wise decision has really, you know, uh, kind of stemmed my, my appreciation for, for math and, and what I've, I'm doing right now. You know, and I, I, I've always been good at numbers and I I've likened it, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, the matrix, you know, where you have ones and zeros coming down. And um, I don't remember the character name in the movie, but Keanu Reeves you know, is able to see like pictures inside there. And um, I don't know, for, for me, that's, that's, that's the best way to explain it to somebody else is, you know, I, I read numbers like a lot of people read a book. You know, you look at the numbers and you can see trends. And that's something that's extremely beneficial, especially when you're looking over things like, you know, rent rolls and T12s and, and stuff. I mean, it may seem pretty boring, but if you're, if you're able to read those numbers like other people read a book, you know, you can see things that a lot of people won't. Right. And there's a lot of, you know, un, un, unseen value that's, that happens, uh, especially with mom and pop owners or people who have been doing it for 20 or 30 years have had the same building. There's a lot of numbers and, and issues that they don't really pay attention to. Uh, and that's where you can really find, uh, you know, really be able to create value, you know, especially in apartments and, and, and commercial real estate investing specifically. Yeah. All right. So before we, we jump into this deal, civic deal, sorry, what is your, your motivation for doing this? What I call your big burning why? Yeah, my real motivation. Uh, I was very, I was very fortunate growing up uh, to where I had parents who were really involved in, in my life and my social, uh, whether it be you know in school, out of school, sports, uh, and I really would like to do that for for my children. Uh, so my why is to be that kind of role model that my parents were to me, and be able to be that person who can take a picture with them on their first day of school. Uh, you know, can be able to take mm -hmm. pick them up and take them to ice cream after. Can can coach their little league team. Can can take them to gymnastics, uh, whatever it may be, to really have a strong presence and be able to build them into you know a really family oriented and and uh, you know a leader in in their own sense. Yeah, yeah, love it. I love it. All right, so we're gonna switch gears right now. Talk, uh, you know, deal specific stuff. And uh, um, first question I want to ask is, you know, how did you um, educate yourself uh, in the multifamily space? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, it, it really comes down to uh, to the old saying, books and tapes. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of yeah. best, the best way that I found education, uh, and a lot of it's free nowadays, which is great. Mm -hmm. Whether it be YouTube or, or podcasts or, or reading books, a lot of my education uh, came from, you know, the typical Bigger Pockets uh, podcasts, especially, uh, and then now kind of the more multifamily route, whether it's Michael Blanc or Jake and Gino. Uh, but I'd say the the most education that I actually received. Uh, wasn't during that time of mm -hmm. you know, being out there to learn and, and read and, and listen to podcasts. The most education and the most value that I got out of, uh, you know, especially learning in my, you know, my first few months was actually doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. So however you're able to, you know, go out and talk to, whether it's talking to brokers or underwriting deals, or I remember, you know, my, when I first started, uh, my partner told me to go, you know, go sign the CA for, for this property. And I had no mm -hmm. idea what a CA was, right. <laughs> it was a very basic thing, and I, but I, I figured it out. And that was my the best, the most education that I got was, was through figuring it out. And I think that's a, that's a great way to, to, to take action and learn. You know, you bring up a great point and, you know, our, our backgrounds, once again, are very similar. And in, incidentally, this, this comes up a lot on the podcast is, you know, there's only so much you can learn by the books and tapes method, you know, the, the podcasts and the, the books and, and whatnot. But uh, um, I, I felt the same way. I mean, once, once I started, once I realized that I would learn more by doing, I almost stopped listening to podcasts. You know, I, I probably went and said, I, for, for a while, I was listening to podcasts everywhere I went, you know, probably two, three, four real estate podcasts a day. Um, you know, I, I wish this podcast was was around, you know, three or four years ago, because I think it's great. But uh, yeah, I was listening to Michael Blanc. I was listening to the Jake and Gina. I was listening to the Rod Cleefs of, of, of the world and the Joe Fairlesses. And, um, you know, once I started getting my hands dirty and started putting stuff into action, I was learning 
a lot faster. And it almost seemed, got to the point to where, you know, podcasts were no longer my, my go-to for learning, you know, just jump, rolling up my sleeves and jumping in ended up being, you know, my, my preferred, preferred method, but uh and, and um, podcasts, they're, they're huge. Uh, just mm-hmm. in, in the education, they're fantastic as far as, you know, short-term energy and motivation and, and learning. You're able to really expand your knowledge and feel as if you are doing it. Uh, yeah. And that's what's really great because podcasts and education and books, they, they really can bridge the gap. Uh, right yeah. between not doing anything and doing something because it gives you kind of, whether it's a false sense or a true sense of confidence it gives you enough to gives you enough you know motivation to start taking action and then that's when you really start taking off and learning yeah. exponentially I, I think that was the key for me too the podcast kept me motivated you know um, sometimes I'd learn stuff sometimes I just hear somebody's story and be like man I can do that too or I want to do that too and a lot of times it just kind of fueled the dream for me and, you know, may, maybe I didn't learn, you know, much about the business, but I also think that's important as well, you know, fueling that dream. But uh, totally um, so let's, let's talk about, you know, how you met your, your business partners. Um, can you go into, give, give us a, a short history on, on how that came about? Yeah. So I met them through, through LinkedIn. I'm, I'm a mm-hmm. huge LinkedIn guy. I love the platform. Uh, I think it has great reach and, and they have a great uh, algorithm uh, in order to not only promote content, but also show you content that, uh, that you're mm-hmm. intrigued in. And basically what I did was I, I sat down and I, I created uh, a, a three-step kind of uh, I wouldn't say it's a program, but kind of, a, you know, a list of things that I would, you know, uh, ask someone and mm-hmm. it initially started with an initial connection with adding a note of saying who I was and, and how I, uh, how and why I'm reaching out. And then the second one after we connected was, you know, saying, Hey, I'm, I have skills in X, Y, Z, and I really want to be in X, Y, Z. And I see that you're doing it. Uh, you know, what is it like? And yeah. then I would ask for 15 minutes of their time. And after, you know, between, uh, you know, 50 and hundred times, just like reaching out to people and getting on the phone and talking to them. Uh, I met a guy named Gary Martinez uh, and Gary Martinez was an industrial broker uh, out of Southern California. And he, mm-hmm. he, you know, my last question was always, you know, what is, what's your biggest problem? Uh, and the biggest problem at the time for him was, you know, finding space for, for his list of tenants to be able to rent out. And he gave me an opportunity and I started cold calling for him. And, and with that, uh, you know, I made a hundred calls a day for about two months and, and we were able to get him two leases. And, and with that, he started to invest in me. And, and one of the things that he did was he invited me on to a past and president role, present roll call of CCIM presidents, uh, mm-hmm. which CCIM is a, is a national, you know, commercial uh, brokerage fraternity in a sense. Um, to where it's it's, kind, it's kind of a, it's a big deal amongst the brokers and people who are inside, not just the brokers, but people who are inside the business. So that's, that, that's a big deal is what that is. Yeah. And I didn't know at the time, uh, I had no idea what a CCIM was. I was just very lucky to be there. And I took advantage of it by asking every person on that call, uh, the same exact three questions. Uh, and, and along the line, I, I met a guy named Robert Lee and, and Robert Lee is in the medical office space and medical office mm-hmm. investing. And he started a, an apartment arm of his business. And that's where he kind of took me on as initially to build systems out for the medical side. Uh, and he saw my interest in apartments and he brought me on as an acquisitions guy. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's kind of where my initial start happened uh, in the multifamily space. And I'm more than happy to share uh, with anyone, you know, my kind of system that I used in order to get on the phone with people through LinkedIn and reaching out uh, and kind of have like a template that I'm, I'm more than happy to share with y'all. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, a great way to, to do things. I mean, LinkedIn is a great platform for protect for professional um, relationships to start professional relationships. You took advantage of it. You reached out to a bunch of people. You were focused on the type of person that you wanted to meet and, and learn from. And that eventually made connections. Um, now, a question I asked you a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to re-ask you again here, but how many people do you think you reached out to on LinkedIn and how many people did you get on the phone? Yeah. So, so that's a good question. I actually, I looked back, you know, going mm-hmm. through, I started scrolling through all of my messages. I mean, I, I would have to say, so I, you know, to, and to your point earlier, uh, LinkedIn, it, it's just such a, such a, uh, a solid platform, uh, especially for people, you know, it, it, uh, of my age where mm-hmm. we don't have that sense of credibility, but LinkedIn has that, that, that sense of, of credibility and professionalism to it, to where you're, you can kind of, uh, be that person that you're trying to to be and kind of uh, present yourself as, 
uh, one of the big things is like I started out with like five connections uh, mm -hmm. and really just poured my time into it, posting every single week. Uh, and now I'm up to, you know, uh, almost 1300 uh, over the over the, you know, the last year, which is more than my Instagram. Uh, but that's just because I've been put, you know, putting more, putting more effort into it. And uh, it's great because after, you know, a couple of weeks, my, my peers and friends started come up and up, coming up to me and they're like, yo, you're like, you're, you're doing, you know, you're doing shit. That's awesome. You know, they, yeah. they're, they're, they think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm really part of it and I'm, I'm very you know, happy that I can be able to you know, add value to them and be a resource for them. Most of my peers, uh, it'll be, you know, three, five years down the road when we'll start, you know, hopefully having conversations when they, you know, get interested in, in real estate investing specifically uh, that yeah. I am the person that, that they think of. Yeah. You know, and that, that's something I found with social media as well is, you know, your friends and family that you may not think of connecting with, a lot of them will self-select and reach out to, to me. And you, you had the exact same thing happen to you. So, you know, le lesson learned right there, you know, use social media as a tool, you know, for help, helping your business grow. And, you know, if, if you're looking for passive investors, if you're looking for partners, you know, whether you're doing JV syndications or whatever, LinkedIn's a great place and social media is a, you know, a great tool to be able to announce to the world what you're doing and people will come, you know, so yeah. if you're doing it right. So, yeah. um, so let, let's, let's fast forward here. So you, you know, lots of calls, lots of messages on LinkedIn, lots of, lots of phone calls. Um, linked you up with, you know, your, your eventual partner. Um, tell us about finding the deal now. Yeah. So it, it was, it was no, not, no easy route. Um, mm -hmm. It was very you know, difficult. I, I do admit it took me, you know, it took us nine months uh, kind of from mm -hmm. when I started and that was, you know, during school. So a lot of my hours outside of school, I'd be taking the time underwriting in it. And it's no, you know, it's no small time commitment for, for the amount of underwriting oh. uh, and you know, how much work you do in front of an Excel sheet. But to, to answer your question, uh, we started, you know, very, very broad in our sense of markets. And that was kind of where we started with, with Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, all that kind of the sun belts where everyone else is focused. And, and it, took a, it took a while to, to gain traction with brokers and talking with that many brokers at, uh, at the time uh, with my current schedule, it was difficult to really gain traction uh, as a relationship and being 3000 miles away and just communicating over phone and email didn't help at all. Uh, didn't no, help much. No, uh, it so doesn't. Weird. Yeah. And that's, you know, it took a long time and, and it took us nine months, but we fortunately were able to, uh, we had a 1031, uh, kind of one of our investors sold one of his personal assets and we had a, he, he was in a 1031. So it was our job to kind of find him his his three bullets that he could use, uh, and that catalyst really you know uh, boosted our uh, you know credibility amongst brokers, uh, especially here in in Lexington. And that's where we found you know on the very the very last day, our last bullet uh, was on this property right behind me. And mm -hmm. something that I never realized uh, until looking back at it is like those nine months, right? It's like the actual offer from, you know, us sitting down and submitting an offer and getting accepted was like, you know, an hour or two hour process. Yeah. Right? And that whole entire nine months, but you know, it seems like it's a waste, but really it's like those nine months prepared, you know, me for, to be able to execute those final two hours and be able to get a deal like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm just very you know blessed and, and happy that yeah. I've been a part of it. Yeah, I'll tell you, you know, it's it's very similar situation, you know, not not downplaying anything, but you know, saying a lot of people who who get to where you're at go through the same process, you know, and over those nine months, you got a lot better at what you're doing. You were you gained more confidence, like you said, and you were able to build those relationships with with brokers, and it doesn't come quickly, you know. Um, so I, I see a lot of flashes in the pan, people who say they're gonna do it and they they realize. I think when they realize that it's going to take nine months to a year before they get a property under contract, you know, a lot of people don't stick with it, but, but you did, you kept on going, you kept on pushing through and, you know, finally you, you got, uh, you got a deal under contract. And uh, one more point I want to double down on is, you know, when, when brokers are talking with newer investors, you've got to be able to convince them that you're going to be able to close and having, you know, 1031 money in your back pocket can you get a loan is, is one question the brokers are going to ask. And can you, can you bring the rest of the money to the table? That's really what the brokers care about. Can you bring the purchase price to the table within the contract time? You know? And if you can do that, you know, you're, you're going to be with one step ahead of everybody else. But having that 1031 money in your back pocket 
you know, is, is going to put you above a lot of other people who are dealing with the same broker or bidding on the same properties. Yeah, exactly. Because of that, it, you know, to your point, it's, it's the efficiency and the, in the accuracy of closing, uh, yeah. you know, between two bids that are the same price, one being a 1031 buyer, one not, uh, more likely that they're going to, you know, the, the seller is going to choose the 1031 buyer because they have to close, mm-hmm. you know, they have to identify you're, they're using one of their three, you know, bullets. Those are, you yeah. know, those of you who aren't familiar with the 1031, you have to use, you know, there's only three properties to identify, or it's, I think it's a, of, there's a certain value at threshold, I think is the other kind of qualification. Uh, yep. that's involved. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, in, in general, you have three properties that you can select, you know, at the 45 day mark and you have to close at the 180 day mark. And incidentally, and this is very coincidentally is uh, this morning's uh, podcast uh, episode 190, I think it was, is on 1031 exchanges. So I literally just just recorded a 10 minute snippet on that, you know, about two hours ago. So, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Since since you have a timeline, you're up against the clock, you're going to close, you know. So the if, if you don't close, you're going to typically pay a very large capital gains tax bill, you know, including depreciation, recapture taxes, and everything else. So. There, there's a lot of incentive with somebody with 1031 money to actually close more so than somebody who, you know, may it may just be bringing personal money to the game. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, and that's, uh, you know, someone who is, you know, we were you know fortunate to have that kind of position. Um, and if you, you know, if you find yourself in the same, you know, basket, use it to, to the full advantage while you have it. Absolutely. All right. So calling a lot of brokers, you found the deal. Tell us about the deal, what you liked about it and uh, what the, the business plan is. Yeah. So this deal, uh, it's actually right here behind me. So if you're watching, mm-hmm. it, you can see the, the retail portion. It's a, it's a mixed use asset. So it has five retail tenants in the front. Uh, and these retail tenants are, are really kind of that health and wellness lifestyle focused brand. Mm-hmm. Uh, Amazon resistant uh, is really kind of what we focus on. Something yep. that that it's not like a JC Penny or a Macy's where Amazon kind of come in and, and you could just buy it from there. For something like this, it's it's those gyms, the boutiques, uh, more of you know uh, kind of the we have a seafood distributor here, uh, so it's very localized and and it's in this area here is really known for its you know local local out locality and and their uh, you know this neighborhood is very mm-hmm. uh, special here. So we like to have, have the fact that it's triple net, you know, it's something where it's commercial long-term lease is very predictable cash flow and, and rent increase bumps. Uh, so it has a good cushion, uh, you know, where we can kind of be confident that we can have a good long-term view. And then in addition to the five retail tenants, we have 31 apartment units in the back. Uh, and that is where we really saw the value at the time. Uh, the owner, yeah. you know, had it for 12 years and there were 11 vacancies uh, when we put in the contract. One of the biggest, uh, you know, concerns that we had was, you know, why, why are there so many vacancies? And the first call that we had with the owner, we asked him, you know, one of, one of our biggest concerns, hey, is, is the 11 vacancies, uh, is there a reason why? And, and he, was, he, didn't, he was confused. He didn't know. He, he, he actually had no idea. He had to ask, you know, his, his office manager at the time, who was the property manager, yeah. uh, you know, if it was true. And, and she's like, yeah, yeah, it is. And the first day at DD when we flew in here, uh, you know, I, I, cause there's no marketing online. Uh, there was no kind mm-hmm. of post of, that it was available. I had to see there was a phone number on the, on the front of the building and I called the number and the phone line was dead. Uh, so it was kind of <laughs> like, you know, all those boxes were checked and it's great to, to be able to, you know, the, to foresee the value is, you know, creating a solid marketing system, you know, using applications that are at our disposable and technology that's available today to be able yeah. to really create a strong ecosystem and around uh, drag- dragging in leads. Uh, and we found that, um, you know, Show Mojo has been a very solid tool for us. And mm-hmm. then really, believe it or not, has been Facebook. Uh, Facebook Marketplace, it's, it's free if you just create kind of a sub account from yourself as the property. Yep and post it uh, on Facebook, we get, uh, you know, at least one or two leads every single day. Uh, and these are, you know, kind of the core demographic that we're trying to reach. Uh, so those have been really, you know, successful factors. And then with those, uh, not only did, were we able to really increase the occupancy uh, being kind of that value add portion, but also 
the average rents were around $500. Uh, mm -hmm. Most tenants have been there for, for uh, a long time. Uh, so we're able to kind of go in immediately and re renovate those 11 units and be able to get, you know, a good premium. And we've been able yeah. to get 699. Um, and every single of those, uni uh, those units, we closed in July. Uh, and we're officially have nine out of the 11 rented. Uh, so nice. in the last few months, uh, we've been able to get, you know, solid tenants in there. And I was putting together, uh, you know, our, uh, I put together an investment update every single month uh, to our investors. And in this month, we had an increase, uh, you know, $25 and 84 cents of our average rent across the building. So that, you know, capped out over those 30 unit, 31 units, uh, if the, you know, taking that yearly cap divided by the you know, average cap rate here, which is about, you know, five cap, uh, it's $884,000 in future value. Um, yeah. So just kind of the power of the cap rate and being able to, to provide, uh, you know, not only value to the investors, but also value to the tenants, whether it's safety, uh, you know, a better living situation, then also, you know, creating jobs for, uh, you know, contractors and subcontractors and, and lenders and, and it's been a it's been a fantastic experience, uh, you know, being part of it. And being yeah. Of it. yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, fortunately, you know, a lot of the value add was just management, you know, getting a good leasing agent, you know, or, or a good property manager, um, you know, somebody who can answer the phone, you know, is, right. is simple, you know, a very, very simple solution to a problem. You can go from a 21 out of 31 units occupied to I think 20 out of 31, um, you know, 11 units down. So you know, rough math in public, you were at like, you know, 65% occupancy. Mm -hmm. And to go up to close to 100, I mean, essentially, all you have to do is put a phone number on there that works and somebody on the other end that can start leasing it out. And um, very simple value add. Um, but yeah, so and I understand you're doing some some renovations too to, to bring things back up to, um, to market level, what, what type of renovations are you guys doing? Yeah, so with these ones, we're going, you know, kind of, uh, you know, very standard. So it'd be new paint, uh, new flooring, new appliances, uh, new lighting has been kind of our, our big kind of core aspect. Uh, there, there was carpet in, in all of the units before. So it's, yep. it's kind of like one of the, one of the big changes. And it, it's great to be able to, to take that and, and be able to use some agreeable gray, uh, you know, nice fresh paint and new appliances and LED lighting and low flush toilets to where we can, you know, make something where it's a very kind of core market, uh, you know, looking unit here in Lexington. And we're able to get, you know, in reflection, those market rents. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's a very smart combination. You know, there's management efficiencies that you guys are working out and, you know, just, you know, $25, you know, a month times 31 divided by a cap rate is a lot of money, you know? So I think, I think you're, you guys were very wise to, to jump on this one. And incidentally, you mentioned this earlier, I'll just recap, you know, the five retail, you know, they're, they're going to have a very different, you know, return profile. And like you said, the benefit of retail is, is there's some very consistent, predictable rents because the tenants are, are signing long-term contracts and the contracts typically have the rent bumps built in, you know, year over year rent bumps. And it's, it's consistent money. You don't necessarily have the same appreciation that you might in multifamily, but at the same time, it's a very consistent cash flow that, you know, when, when you look at the overall, the overall project, you have five units with very consistent cash flow and you've got, you know, 31 units where you can do a significant value add. Yeah, I think that's a, a winner all the way around. So let's yeah, talk about, helps. go ahead. Yeah, it really helps kind of with just kind of risk risk adjustment, right? Because uh, yeah. you have the two aspects. You have, you know, that's really important what kind of tenant mix you have and, and having that, you know, pad in order to, you know, you can cover your expenses and your, and your debt service with the retail, but then you have that kind of upside uh, with the apartments that really, you know, you get a good return and risk profile uh, with the mixed use asset. Now, was, was the 1031 investor the only investor in this case, or, or do you have more, more people involved? Yeah, so that's a great question. We actually ended up not using the 1031 uh, <laughs> you know, investor and, and, his, and, and the money that he had to do 1031. He ended up going with a, a different project, mm -hmm. um, different group, 
uh, which was totally okay. So we had to, to raise money and we syndicated this through, uh, you know, a group of a group of high net worth individuals that that have had relationships or my partners have had relationships um, on previous deals with and just kind of been being being in the industry over the last, you know, uh, you know, 20 years or so, uh, they've had their kind of own contacts and we ended up syndicating with, a, you know, a, a smaller group, uh, but it was, you know, we raised the equity. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's good. Good thing. You guys were flexible enough to be able to shift, shift on that one, because, you know, if you're, if you're banking on one person coming in and doing the entire, you know, funding and that one person drops out, you know, a lot of people are scrambling, you know, a lot of people end up, uh, you know, wondering, okay, what, what are we going to do now? But you guys were able to quickly fill that gap and, and get, get the ball rolling again. Um, so you talked a little bit about capital raising. You've talked about some of the, the capital ex- expenditures, your renovation plans you've done since. Let's talk about the closing process. Were there any big hitches, you know, getting across the closing line? Yeah, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind was, you know, the bank, the bank appraisal. Uh, you know, when you're working mm-hmm. with a bank, it, it usually takes a, a pretty good amount of time. So you got to be very careful and, and make sure you allow enough lead time uh, when working mm-hmm. with the bank, specifically the appraisal. Uh, because of you know the current environment that we are in and that we were in, uh, the lead time was was pretty extended. Uh, so it was a good four weeks before we were able to actually get you know a, an appraisal date set, uh, and then also be able to receive appraisal from the bank. In addition to that, uh, you know having the getting the, the inspector out here and getting a, someone to to be able to do an Alta survey and an engineer, um, everyone was very booked out in advance. So that was something that. Uh, that we were, had to be very conscientious of as far as a timeline, uh, we did have to, you know, extend uh, one time and, and do the, the amendment, but, you know, uh, we're very thankful that the seller was willing to work with us on that, uh, and we were able to get all the information, uh, you know, in and under, you know, within a, a good time frame. Yeah. Yeah. And in, incidentally, you know, the, the bank, the lending is, is typically the single longest process in everything. And every time we've extended, it's been because we were waiting for, you know, lenders almost every single time, you know, sometimes it takes a while for those third parties to get ordered. And sometimes, you know, the third party providers, you know, the, the appraisers take a while to get out to the property, but uh, just, just understanding that will, will help you, you know, navigate the process when the time comes. Um, exactly. And now, like when we look at our, you know, when we look at deals now, I'm, I make sure I, you know, we, we, we schedule out ahead of time and, and we're ready, you know, because to give enough lead time just in case, because, because a cushion, you know, is sometimes eaten and usually uh, it, it, it gets, you know, it, a bite's taken out of that time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, something that, you know, a couple of gurus I've heard say, they say delay spending money as long as possible. Delay spending money. It's a risk capital. You don't want to put that money at risk. And on our first property, we delayed the loan application fee, you know, and and this particular lender was charging the third party reports up front before they would put the application or before they would process the application. And um, I'll tell you what, uh, that almost came back to bite us at the back end because, you know, we, we had, we ended up waiting for that lender to, to be able to close. But yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a risk either way. You want to get those third parties. You want to get that, uh, the lender working as soon as possible. So, you know, some there, there's, there's a nice little balance point somewhere between, you know, let's, let's make sure our risk capital is not going to be lost, but at the other point, you know, making sure things are getting, done fast enough. So um, anyway, that said, let's see, we talked a little bit about uh, first steps after closing. Um, oh, incidentally, when did you move out there? Yeah. So really it, it was, it was perfect timing. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I, we went under contract uh, April, April, March, March, April. Uh, and then I graduated in May mm-hmm. and we were set to close, you know, July 14th. Uh, and it was kind of a situation where, you know, everything kind of lined up perfectly where I took kind of a leap in a leap of faith in a sense uh, and kind of just, you know, got in the car and my mom yeah. came with me and, uh, and we drove across the country. So I, I landed here, uh, left there about July 5th and, uh, you know, drove across the country and I've been here since, you know, uh, you know, July 10th ish. And it's been a, it's been a great experience, you know, being on site and being able to, you know, really work hands on with our on site manager. And I have to admit, you know, learning some of the the nuances, such as I know how to like, you know, fix a faucet now. I know how to replace, you know, a tub stem. It's 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 mm-hmm. just pretty cool yeah. stuff. Uh, is uh, so experiences that I don't think I would have been able to get. You know, uh, you know, I wouldn't want them any other way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that kind of segues right into the next question. You know, what what's next for you? 
Yeah, that's that's a great question. I think next for me is is really kind of staying here and, and uh, you know creating a good network of brokers here in town and also owners uh, and being able to find you know more deals similar to this uh, and kind of you know uh, you know working in the acquisitions role. You know, I'm a lot more confident now, kind of going through the process. Uh, you know. Uh, of renovations and knowing kind of even down to like a square foot basis of what each of it's going to everything's going to cost us uh so now i know like it's gonna be about eight dollars and fifty cents a square foot you know depending mm -hmm. on the building uh that we can get for for a nice clean renovation that's going to bring us up to par with this building here uh, and be able to attract a, a good tenant base uh, so being able to take that information and now uh being on site when when i get a you know a call from a broker uh, that, about a property that may be coming to the market or something that's kind of in his back pocket, uh, I'm able to get in my car and drive and be there within, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, yeah. uh, which has been very valuable and, and, and been able to really, you know, uh, I've been able to gain some, some nice traction. Uh, so we're looking at more deals here in town and, and you know, hopefully with, with uh, the path that we're going right now that we'll be able to, to scale this, uh, you know, into a couple hundred units here. Awesome. And just rewinding, you know, if, if you were to hit the, you know, go back 20 minutes on the podcast button, you, you mentioned that one of the biggest challenges getting started was trying to invest in that area from 3000 miles away, you know, so, you know, by moving out there, you, you've basically knocked out several birds with one stone, you know, you're going to have better management because you're, you're out there. And your acquisitions train is going to run a lot smoother because once again, you're out there and, you know, the, the benefit of being 15, 20 minutes away, or even an hour or two away from some of the properties gives you a lot more flexibility than you would have had sitting in, you know, Mesa, Cal La Mesa, California, right? So is yeah, that where you, that, that's where SDSU live is, is that where you lived? Yeah, I, so my, my last year I was in PB, so I was in Pacific Beach. Oh, that's uh, even nicer than La Mesa. That was fantastic, so, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I, yeah. I could, I can't complain, and, and yeah. you know, it's such a good point that you, that you bring up, because uh, it's, you know, every, every single market is going to have its own areas that, that of where, you know, where it's growing, right? Whether it's a single neighborhood or a sub market, uh, you know, one of the things that was a, was a big struggle in the beginning, uh, you know, was having that kind of broad net and having those multiple markets kind of looking all at the same time and, and being able to gain traction with brokers from that far away uh, mm -hmm. was, was difficult. Um, and then, you know, being able to pick a market kind of that you're relatively close to or, or that you like to go or you have family in, uh, you know, gives you another reason to get out there, uh, which I think is really yeah. important uh, when when deciding on a market, because every market, like I said, has has its own neighborhoods and sub markets that are growing and that you can find places to invest in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. So last last two questions, you know, first one is, you know, probably the most important, but uh, what advice would you give an aspiring investor that's, you know, six to 12 months behind you? Yeah, six to 12 months behind me, uh, I would say, you know, like, uh, really focusing on one market, uh, you know, one or two markets that you really like, whether it's, you know, personally, you have family there, uh, or, you know, somewhere that's within a, you know, whether it's 15 minutes or, or a two hour drive, somewhere that you could be that you could drive around and kind of, you know, start looking at uh, real estate and, and looking at the market, you know, go, uh, you know, secret shop in a sense and, and go just find out kind of what's happening, what's what's going on uh, and really hone in on, on one market because, yeah. you know, having good relationships with one to three brokers is a lot more important than having, you know, very partial relationships with 20. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I agree. Um, you know, once, once again, we we started gaining traction when we focused on on single metros, you know, so um, when I when I narrowed it down from anywhere in the U.S. to, you know, um, one or two metros, all of a sudden, you know, things started working. So very, very good advice. Thank you. Um, last question. How can listeners learn more about you? Yeah, the best way to learn about me or to, to get in touch with me. Uh, so I have a couple, you know, platforms. I like, like we kind of talked before. I, I love mm -hmm. LinkedIn. Uh, so just Dylan Palmer on LinkedIn. That's D Y L A N Palmer P A L M E R. Uh, and then also kind of something that I've just started doing now that I'm on site is I've been really utilizing Instagram. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you want to follow me on Instagram, go ahead. It's it's Dylan underscore Palmer thirteen. And what I've been doing is that every time we've had you know a major capex item or a renovation, I've been posting it on my story and, and kind of collecting those stories and those little bubbles. So you, eventually when, when the full turn happens and we're stabilized, I'm going to be able to take that video and really create a, uh, a, a nice, you know, presentation for whether it's investors or just people that are interested yeah. in real estate and what happens, you know, during the process of a renovation, uh, you know, a lot of investors, 
you know, they're going to have those monthly updates, but, but not all of them get to see kind of what happens on the day to day. So I love to be able to be that, that bridge and that gap. And I have, you know, I try to you know, do as much content as I can and just share my experiences. And then I'll always emails, you know, just deep holler yeah. at urban renewal partners. Uh, that's a good way to do it too. Sweet. So we'll put uh, links to LinkedIn, Instagram, and your email address in the show notes. Anybody interested in connecting with Dylan, um, you know where to find the show notes. So, um, well, that said, thank you so much for, for coming on the show today. I really appreciate your time and wish you the best of luck in, in the near future. Well, in the far future too. Yeah. Well, Brian, thank you very much for having me. It's was, it was a pleasure to, uh, to be on the podcast. Thank you.